Good evening, everybody, um, and welcome, huge welcome to the third in uh, this season's series of winter warmer talks, which are aimed at bringing you something a little bit different during these winter months uh, and to, to highlight and showcase the different features of our uh, wonderful Royal Parks. Uh, my name is Richard Perring. I'm the Senior Learning Manager at the Royal Parks, um, and we are the charity uh, that looks after the eight Royal Parks in London. So these are Hyde Park, Kenston Gardens, the Green Park, St James's Park, Regent's Park and Primrose Hill, Bushy Park, Greenwich Park and Richmond Park. Uh, and we also manage the incredible Brompton Cemetery and Victoria Tower Gardens as well. Through our work, we aim to engage as many people as possible with the um, amazing rich heritage that the parks have to offer, um, keeping them free and accessible so that everybody can enjoy the well-being benefits if they want to, and uh, also to protect and improve the really precious biodiversity of these parks. Um, we're putting this series of talks on for free because we want to share our enthusiasm and our love for these special spaces with as many people as possible. Uh, and we're delighted to welcome so many of you to join us this evening. Uh, the Royal Parks is a charity, so while this talk is free to join, we would really greatly appreciate any donation that you can make to support our work to look after these amazing spaces. And I'll, uh, I'll put a link in the chat if you'd like to do that um, shortly. Uh, just a reminder that this talk uh, is being recorded so that it can be uploaded and accessed on our YouTube channel for other people to enjoy. So your names um, and your faces, if you end up going on camera, um, which you won't have to, but you can <laughs> choose to later on, um, may appear in this recording. Um, please do feel free to use the chat to say hello. Uh, let us know where you're listening from. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and uh, also to ask any questions you may have for our speaker, which I'll put to him at the end. So um, fire away in the chat box and uh, I'll collect those together and we'll put them to, uh, to Andrew, our speaker, at the end of the session. Uh, you're also welcome to react if you want to. Uh, there's a, you should see a reactions button, some, uh, button somewhere on your screen. Um, uh, you can applaud or uh, let me give myself a big love heart just to demonstrate. Uh, let's see if that works. There we go. I think that's what I'm doing. Um, but so feel free to use those if you'd like to um, to respond to what's uh, going on. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's guest speaker. So Andrew Mayfield is the community archaeologist for the four year Greenwich Park Revealed project uh, and the first ever in-house archaeologist for the Royal Parks. Uh, before joining us, he worked as a community archaeologist for Kent County Council for more than 10 years, running a series of projects uh, at Country Parks on Commons and across Romney Marsh. As part of Greenwich Park Revealed, uh, he's working with the public, schools, volunteers, specialists and others to uncover some of Greenwich Park's archaeological secrets, which he'll be sharing with you this evening. Uh, he's done such a brilliant job so far that la last summer he won the Marsh Community Archaeologist of the Year Award, uh, which is presented to the individual who has delivered exceptional archaeological work within their communities and who helps to sustain our cultural heritage for future generations, as well as inspiring others to share their love of archaeology. So we're all very lucky to be spending an hour with an expert and enthusiast with some fascinating stories to tell. Uh, and with that, Andrew, uh, over to you. Thank you, Richard. I don't really know how to follow that, but I will I'll do my best. OK, I'm going to uh, start by sharing my presentation. Now, hopefully everyone can see that uh, I will start talking if there's any issues or the slides don't progress. I'm sure Richard will let me know. Um, so. Thank you everyone for um, coming along this evening and uh, listening to this talk about community archaeology in a Royal Park uh, and the work we're doing with the Greenwich Park Revealed project. Uh, the first slide here, just to give you a little taster, is an aerial photograph of our Saxon Barrow Cemetery in Greenwich Park, um, taken a few years ago now by Aerial Cam, and it just shows some of the burial mounds in the park and also this nice trackway running north-south, this hollow way running through the site itself. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Greenwich Park, uh, Greenwich Park is situated uh, here in South East London, just north of Blackheath and east of Deptford, um, with the Isle of Dogs to the north, um, just um, uh, under this, or this big oxbow bend in the river here, uh, running through the Thames, running into central London. Um, 
if hopefully everyone can see my pointer, this road coming in here is Shooter's Hill, uh, part of the old Roman road coming across and into um, uh, London itself. And we are hoping through the project and the work to come to see if we can trace any evidence for the Roman road going through Greenwich Park. But you can see the, the sort of the straight line of this road coming up to the park. And we're hoping before the end of the project to try and identify where the Roman road runs through the park. So um, as we progress, we've got another year and a half of the project to go. You uh, do keep in touch and, and we will update you on our on our discoveries. So um, I've been working for the Royal Parks now for a, uh, just over a year and a half. And, and as Richard said, I've come from a sort of community archaeology background. I've worked as a community archaeologist for over 10 years now. Um, I've also worked as a historic environment record officer for Kent County Council. And before that, I had a stint in commercial archaeology, uh, looking at archaeology ahead of um, development work, uh, including sites such as Heathrow in London and various sites in the city. Um, lots of rural sites in Kent um, and even the sort of the sunny delights of places like uh, Gloucestershire and the Fens. So I've, I've uh, travelled around a bit with my archaeological travels uh, and also abroad. Um, so I came to the Royal Parks and I, I've been there for a year and a half, um, but I do have a sort of an, a, a longer family link with the Royal Parks and with Greenwich. Um, hopefully you can see this image here. This is on the right. This is the Silver Jubilee. This is the Queen's Barge going up the Thames. And this is a photo that my uh, my dad had as a postcard. And somewhere in there, uh, a naval officer is, is my dad, in fact, in the in 1977, just before I was born, um, lined up to salute the Queen going up the Thames. So I have sort of long family links with uh, Greenwich and the um, Old Royal Naval College. Um, and then behind, hopefully, you can also see the observatory and the wolf statue. Um, I also need to thank all of the volunteers who I know some of them are on this chat who have helped out with the project to date. Um, a community archaeology project is only a success really down to the, the, the volunteers who take part. Otherwise, I would just be sort of standing in a field on my own. Uh, and I can't do it without all of the many people who take part and encourage us uh, uh, both on site and with research. Uh, and absolutely invaluable. And um, we've had volunteers um, who live just outside the park uh, and wider across wider London and volunteers coming up from Kent as well. So we've had a really nice mix of volunteers uh, with this project. And I also just want to thank Historic England for all of their advice and support. Um, we have two Historic in England advisors, uh, Jane Siddell and Mark Stevenson, and their advice and support have been absolutely invaluable for this project. And I should also mention um, our, the National Lottery uh, Heritage Fund for their um, funding of the project and allowing us to do all this amazing archaeological work. So why is Greenwich Park so special? I always like showing this image because it, it, it's the one that everyone comes to the park to take. For those of you that haven't been to the park, I mean, why not? <laughs> Firstly, but you you must come to the park and and obviously you'll you'll go up to the wolf statue and you'll take in this view looking across to the Isle of Dogs um, and you'll see Canary Wharf beyond. But in the foreground there we've got Queensfield and although it doesn't look like it now, this was actually full of World War II allotments during World War II um, and during World War One, in fact. And then behind we've got the Queen's House, uh, the old Royal Naval College, which is now the University of Greenwich and the Maritime Museum. And hopefully those of you who have got a large enough screen may also see Blackheath Power Station there and the dome beyond. So um, the park is special because it's a royal park um, and we have a, a palace next door. So underneath um, uh, the uh, Naval Museum, there was a Tudor Palace. Uh, we have um, over five million visitors, visitors a year. Uh, we're part of a World Heritage Site for Maritime Greenwich. It's a grade one listed landscape, so it's one of the most protected landscapes in the country. We have three scheduled monuments, uh, and those are the sort of most protected individual monuments in the country. And our scheduled monuments are the observatory itself, um, the Roman temple and the Saxon barrows. And we have a wealth of archaeology um, from prehistoric from the prehistoric period through to World War II and the present. Um, Although I'm still looking for um, our sort of first really great prehistoric site, there must be one somewhere in the park. 
we've got a whole range of archaeology from the Roman period onwards, but I'm still on the hunt for a really good prehistoric one. So again, hopefully over the next year and a half, we'll be able to find one uh, and actually sort of complete our um, panoply of uh, archaeological sites. I've just put in here a little um, background to uh, Greenwich Park. And I know these are all um, unfortunately men, but <laughs> it is men in the past who have shaped the park and the way it looks today. Um, on the left, we have um, uh, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, who in the 1400s, over 600 years ago, um, was the first person to enclose the park. So he fenced in the park. Um, then you have uh, James I here at the bottom left, uh, and he's the first person to build a brick wall around the park in the early 1600s. On the right, we have, I'm sure many of you will recognise him, uh, Henry VIII. And Henry VIII lived, uh, one of his favourite palaces with the, was the Tudor Palace of Placentia, which is the palace that was down on the underneath what is now the Naval Museum um, and the Old Royal Naval College. And this was a, a huge Tudor palace which had a jousting yard because, as we know, uh, Henry VIII loved to joust and to eat and to do other things. Um, but the jousting yard was a key part of this Tudor palace. And then in the middle at the bottom, we have uh, Charles II. And Charles II um, was the last member of the royal family to have a real impact in the park in terms of the landscape changes he made to the park. And I'll return to those shortly. So we have a sort of long and distinguished history with a number of very famous characters coming into the park, interacting with the park and changing elements of the park to create the landscape we see today. So Greenwich Park Revealed is the project I'm working as a community archaeologist for, and this is an eight million uh, plus investment into uh, the park, uh, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the National Lottery Community Fund. And we're running, a, we're going to develop uh, with a whole series of improvements to the park to help um, better deal with sort of the number of visitors we have coming to the park. So we're going to hopefully widen um, access to the park, improve the interpretation, build new buildings for education and a new cafe. Um, also make improvements to the uh, the tree treescape in the park um, and various path and other improvements. We're also, we've just completed work to run a, a, a water pipe all the way down to the boating lake to supply the boating lake with borehole water. So we're doing a whole range of projects and all of these letters that you might be able to see covering this map are, are different improvements we're making to the park over the course of our five year project. Now, key to those, the key to this project, uh, well, there are two elements to the project. There's a landscape element and a build element. Now, the landscape element, um, uh, we're making a number of improvements to the landscape um, to sort of um, help preserve the landscape um, for future generations. And we can see in this image here, it's a LIDAR image of the park. Now, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging and basically gives you an image of the park with all the lumps and bumps. And so what you can do with LIDAR is it can be flown. It's a basic, it's a laser survey. You can fly it from a plane. You can fly it from a helicopter. You can fly it from a drone. Um, and it basically sends down thousands and thousands of laser hits. And those returns will then tell you about the different topography of the park. Uh, it's a bit like shining a ray of light across the park and it's picking out all those details. So in this image, you can hopefully see um, firstly the, the, the flat terrain at the top of the park near Blackheath Gate. Then you've got our very sort of, uh, steep ridge running down towards Queensfield and the museum below. Uh, you've got the parterre and the Grand Ascent, which I'll come back to. Um, One Tree Hill and a whole series of quarries around it. And uh, then you've got our Saxon Barrows, which I will show you in a bit more detail, and our large Victorian reservoir. And all of these you can pick out really clearly on this LIDAR. And it's a really great way of, of taking a snapshot of the landscape and really understanding what that landscape is telling us. So when Charles II came to the throne in the 1660s, one of the first things he did um, was to uh, look at the Tudor Palace and he decided he wanted to improve the um, the garden landscape behind the palace, so around the Queen's Field. And so he employed a very famous um, garden designer from France called Le Nôtre, who had um, designed Versailles, Versailles, uh, gardens at Versailles and other um, 
famous um, uh, places in France. Um, and he employed him to, to uh, implement a design at Greenwich Park. And on the left here, you can see his plan um, for Greenwich Park. The little building in the middle there is the Queen's House. And this area behind um, is the, the parterre and then the Grand Ascent, which runs up to the, uh, which is now the wolf statue at the, at the back here. And so Charles II um, uh, paid people then to come in and re-landscape this area in front of the Queen's House and actually implement these banks, these tree-lined banks, and then uh, create a series of earth steps running up to what is now the observatory. But having done all that work, he then didn't complete the plan um, because, as you can see, hopefully on Le Nurture's plan on the left, the plan it was the idea was to then add a series of fountains, arcades, uh, columns, colonnades, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, running up the hillside, and none of that work was done. And in fact, by the 1670s, Charles II had his cannons lined up in front of the Queen's house and was firing into that hillside. So he'd really he'd really lost interest in this designed landscape that he was hoping to implement, and he was more interested in, in living at some of the other palaces he owned. So in addition to the landscape, we've also got a build element to our project and the build element. Um, I should say this is a fantastic image here, which shows you um, our main avenue, Blackheath Avenue, the observatory, um, the Thames sweeping round and then central London beyond a really great uh, aerial image. Um, the build element of the project it will see us um, build a new learning centre in the park in the wilderness. The wilderness is runs along the southern edge of the park and is where the deer are, where the deer live. At the moment, the deer are on holiday in Richmond Park, but they will be coming back at the end of the project. Um, so we're going to build a new learning centre and then in the southeast corner of the park, we're going to convert one of the old lodges, Vambra Lodge, into a cafe, um, public toilets and volunteer facilities and some archive space for all of the finds I'm finding in the park and are going to find over the next few years. Um, so if you come to the park over the next year, couple of years, you'll see a lot of changes, but also a lot of improvements, um, which will um, in, uh, sort of enable us to manage the, the huge visitor numbers we have to the park more effectively and also to help preserve the landscape for generations going forwards. So I'm going to talk about um, a few of the projects I've been involved with over the course of Greenwich Park Revealed so far, the first year and a half. Um, now, the first of those is a project to do with the Saxon Barrows. So in this image, this is an aerial image taken by the University of Greenwich, their Captivate unit. And hopefully everyone can see these round rings on here. This is a sort of um, uh, an improved aerial image to bring out the colours. And all of these rings are possible Saxon Barrows. Now, some of them survive as lumps and bumps above ground, but some of them, particularly the ones running down the hillside here, are much more faint and harder to see. But if you can photograph them at the right time of year, you can really start to pick out the details here. So we know we have a very busy uh, Anglo-Saxon cemetery uh, in the west half of the park. This is near Crooms Hill. We're through my sort of the research we've been doing on the site, um, hopefully you'll be able to see in this image the earliest image I've found so far of the mounds themselves. And if you can just make out this little, these areas of shading, I think are actually uh, a 1670 etching showing the barrows for the first time. So we have no illustrations of the barrows for the first thousand years they are in existence, or no illustrations we found to date. But by the sort of late 1670s, you can actually start to see um, them illustrated for the first time. Now, this illustration, this etching by Francis Place, um, was actually drawn from the top of the, the newly built observatory. So the observatory uh, was built on the site of Duke Humphrey's tower. Um, Duke Humphrey, who I mentioned at the beginning, he had his own little uh, sort of small castle or folly in the park. Um, and that was pulled down by Charles II and the observatory was built on top of it. And this image shows the views from the top of that new observatory building. And this line here, which looks like a crease in the page, is actually one of the telescopic mounts for one of the telescopes that was actually winched up um, this post here. And you can just make out some of these tree avenues, um, which we are assuming were planted by Charles II, um, if not slightly earlier, um, in the background. 
and also I'm not sure if it shows up very well, but there are also deer shown. So at this point in the 1600s, the deer still ranged over the whole of the park. And it's only really in the 20th century that they've actually been pushed back into one corner of the park. So um, the barrows have been dug or bothered, as I like to say, by two individuals, someone called Mr. Hearn and someone called Mr. Douglas. So Mr. Hearn was an antiquarian um, in the early 1700s who was the first person to dig some of the mounds on the uh, in Greenwich Park. Now, Douglas later refers to him as a keeper of the uh, keeper of the park, but we haven't tracked down anyone called Mr. Hearn who was a keeper or park ranger. But there was a keeper of the Bodleian Library um, called Thomas Hearn, and we think that this is perhaps the same person, and he was an antiquarian. So we know that he dug into the mounds in about 1714, but left no record of what he'd done. So we don't know what he found, we don't know how many mounds he dug into, but we know he was active on the site. And then in 1784, um, so 60, 60 years later, James Douglas came along, 70 years later, James Douglas came along and excavated at the Barrow site for this for the second time. Now, thanks to his um, published book, The Nenia Britannica, which is available to, see, to, to view in the British Library, we actually have a lovely image of James Douglas excavating at the Anglo-Saxon Cemetery. You can see in the background the observatory, which at this point is about 100 years old. You can see deer in the park here, and you can see a whole series of mounds. And then in the foreground, you can see James Douglas, who was also a priest. Um, he was actually a clergyman to the king as well, sitting on the edge of this mound, um, uh, overseeing his workmen. Uh, now, his approach was to dig straight into the top of the mound, keep going down till he found something and then widened out uh, and then collected all the finds. So we know he did find um, a number of Saxon artifacts, but because he didn't produce a plan or we haven't got a plan of what he did, we don't know which artifacts came from which um, of the mounds. And unfortunately, all of the artifacts have also now been lost over time, apart from one item I will show you. So he did draw some of the artifacts. Um, now, the one at the top, I think, is possibly a, a ship nail. Now, in the Anglo-Saxon period, there was a tradition for burying um, ship nails in graves. It doesn't mean we have a, a ship up there. I don't think we've got a Sutton Hoo burial, but you do get, I think they're called, there's a, a tradition of sort of, uh, almost like false ship burials. So you get burials with uh, ship nails in. So this looks to me very much like a rove. The thing in the middle, is, believe it or not, actually an Anglo-Saxon spearhead. Um, obviously very corroded because it had been buried in the uh, acidic grassland there. Um, the acidic grassland, which we're hoping to restore now across this landscape, which is very important for pollinators, but isn't very good for metalwork. So you can see this thousand year old spearhead is definitely suffering. And if it hadn't been conserved at the time, I doubt whether it would have lasted a few years after James Douglas dug it up. So I'm assuming now that all of these objects have actually crumbled into nothing if they had survived at all. And at the bottom, we have a coffin nail. And we know that James Douglas does refer to um, a se uh, what he thinks were a series of coffins in these different mounds. He's seeing uh, basically stains in the ground, which he thinks is what's left of the decomposed coffin. And he was also finding uh, coffin nails. Um, and then these little dots, it depends on the size of your screen, but these dots are called a wound spiral beads. And these are very datable and they date from the seventh century. And so we know that at least one of the burials, or perhaps two, depending on um, how many beads he had from which burials, were of that date. And so the, the cemetery has been dated to the sort of sixth, seventh century AD, so about 1400 years ago. Um, although we, know, we don't know anything about the individuals who were buried there, because Douglas said none of the bodies had survived in the ground. I, I always love this quote. This is from uh, Douglas's Nenia Britannica, and he says that on the succeeding day, I, prose I prosecuted the research and opened 12 more um, barrows in one day. So if you think today that an archaeological excavation, you might spend months digging one burial mound. James Douglas, an antiquarian in 1784, dug 12 burial mounds in a day. 
Um, so he talks about the extraordinary phenomenon of the preservation of human hair and woolen cloth. But I think equally the extraordinary phenomenon is the fact that he managed to dig 12 of these burials, these burial mounds in a day. Um, so below, hopefully you can see um, there is a small um, sort of um, uh, a preservation of a, 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 an element of sort of woolen cloth here on the left. Um, so this small fragment of cloth probably was preserved by being next to an iron nail. And so um, the corrosion products have actually preserved it. Um, but we have this small um, element of cloth. So we know that some of the burials were buried, um, pres presumably clothed or with clothing in the burials. And on the right, you've got some beads here again on a string. I reckon this string is probably Douglas's addition, but we definitely have um, more evidence for beads. In the centre is what Douglas thought was human hair, but I think it's probably more likely a bundle of wool. Um, now this has survived in the Ashmolean. We know that when Douglas died, he gave a lot of his artefacts to a friend of his, who then gave them to the Ashmolean uh, Museum in Oxford. But unfortunately, only this, only this uh, bundle of wool or hair appears to have survived in their archive. So this is the one artefact we have from the burials still surviving um, Douglas's excavations from the 1780s. Now, if you look at the site today, if you visit at the right time of year, you'll see that all of the mounds have got little tufts on them. They look like little, little sort of Mohicans, and these Mohicans um, are Douglas's holes. So each of these tufts are where Douglas dug into the burrows. So you can see almost all of the mounds on um, the ridge um, above up, um, in the park have got these tufts in them. So they've all been dug into by Douglas. Um, so he has had a really, really um, good go at investigating the site. And anything basically that was still a mound when he reached the site in the 1780s, he's dug into. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, um, a hundred, um, I'm not hundred, sixty years after James Douglas um, excavated at the site, the Admiralty decided that the um, mounds were the perfect place to build an emergency reservoir for Deptford docks. So this map here, for the Sayer map um, from the 1840s, uh, hopefully everyone can see these pimples here. These are the the Barrows and the Barrow Cemetery, and then the Admiralty came along and said, "We're going to build our reservoir here." and hopefully you can see a red ring now. Um, so the Admiralty decided they were going to flatten um, half of the cemetery to put their reservoir in because they weren't worried about um, Saxon burial mounds. They just wanted the perfect place for their emergency reservoir. Now, there was a public outcry, and I think it's probably one of the earliest recorded um, sort of public archaeology campaigns um, against uh, this um, this happening and you can see here in the illustrated london news that it refers to i love this comment a, a set of the world's worst end wretches were let loose on the barrows um so there was a petition to parliament and the admiralty were um, uh, told to stop flattening some of the burial mounds and it was suggested that they move the reservoir to the south where it is today um now this uh, so the middle of the 19th century the, the victorian period coincides with when the park was opened up to the public for the first time. Before this point, you had to have a key or a permit to go into the park. It was private, but from the middle of the Victorian period, it was opened up to the public. And so you can see here um, a happy Victorian throng visiting, to the, visiting the barrows um, uh, and sort of uh, uh, happy to have uh, sort of won their campaign to preserve the site. You can also just about make out here, I think there's sort of um, a Douglas, sort of Douglas, the Douglas hole in the top of the mound. So they're obviously um, the tops of the mound were still um, plainly um, ex sort of exhibiting the scars of Douglas's digging. As if this wasn't bad enough, in the 1860s, a path was then built across the barrows to connect uh, Crooms Hill Gate uh, with the um, uh, uh, the main drag down to St Mary's Gate um, and to, to where the toilets are now. And then in the 1890s, um, the barrows were fenced in as, as part of the sort of the path works. So the, the, the site was one of the sort of was one of the few Anglo-Saxon cemeteries with a path, a sort of concrete tarmac path running through the middle of it. It was uh, the site was surveyed in the 1920s by A.R. Martin who was a local archaeologist, 
and then in the 1990s by the Royal Commission, um, who tried to sort of identify as many of the mounds that they could see as possible. A.R. Martin was also the first person to actually number the mounds and for, the, for his plan to survive. And so we still use his numbering system to identify which mound is which. You can also see, hopefully, on the left image here, the reservoir constructed in the 1840s and how large it was and how much damage it would have done if they'd completed works on the Barrow site. On the right image, you can hopefully see there's a gravel pit to the east of the Barrows. And uh, Douglas refers to this gravel pit when he's working there. So we know the gravel pit is at least as old as um, Douglas's um, work in the 1700s. And I do wonder perhaps whether some of the spoil from this was used to create the mounds at the Barrow site. Now, this is another LIDAR image, and hopefully you can see all the pimples here, which are the burial mounds in the park. Um, so this shows uh, the range of barrows. It also shows the reservoir to the south. And then hopefully you can just make out uh, to the east of the barrows, these lines, I'm sure showing them with my cursor. I think these lines are ridge and furrow. And ridge and furrow is a sort of a medieval farming technique. Uh, and so presumably before Duke Humphrey enclosed the park in the 1400s, people were also trying to farm this landscape. It must have been, it had a very low return because it's acidic grassland. And I, I don't think um, crops would grow very well on it, on gravels. But attempts were being made in the medieval period to farm this landscape before it was enclosed. Um, but you can also make out the barrows here and our on our quarry pit here as well. So coming forward, what did we want to do next? So the Anglo-Saxon Cemetery was scheduled ahead of the Olympics in 2012 uh, to, to, to give it sort of national protection. And this meant that Obviously, any work we want to do on the site, we have to get permission from Historic England. But we were very keen within Greenwich Park Revealed to remove this path and actually to, to return the, restore the barrows to their landscape setting without the path running through the middle of them. So in the end of 2021, uh, we uh, started a project to remove the park, working with um, uh, uh, contractors. And then uh, an archaeological team made up of volunteers, both locally and further afield, then um, worked behind the contractor to check for archaeology. And we also dug a series of pits into um, the area where the track had been to see what archaeology was buried beneath the trackway. The track was actually quite thick, so in many places we didn't need to go through it to restore the area to acid grassland. But we did dig some dig. We did. Deep, we dig, well, I can't say it, we did dig, did dig, did dig some deeper trenches to actually look at the archaeology below. This is another one of these fantastic aerial photos from the University of Greenwich. Um, so over the course of the late autumn, early winter of 2021, uh, a team of volunteers put over 600 hours into investigating the Barrow Cemetery as the path was removed and the landscape was restored. And some of you on this uh, uh, talk this evening may recognize yourselves in these images. And my thanks again to all of those who helped out. Working with Historic England, we were able, allowed to dig a couple of trenches that just kissed the edges of um, four of the Barrow Mounds to see if we could understand the Barrows a bit further. And so you can hopefully see here Trench 3 and Trench 4 um, straddle between four of the mounds. This is also a nice little detailed map showing the Royal Commission survey, a really lovely archaeological plan of the barrows um, and their possible ditches around them. So trench three, which was the eastern trench, um, where my cursor is, hopefully you can see some lines. So what we think we've actually identified by digging just to the very edge of the mounds is we've got an insight into how the mounds were perhaps constructed. And it looks like you've got um, a layer of gravel here with a layer of turf, another layer of gravel, another layer of turf, and then a larger layer built up above it. Now, these are sort of layers here being built up over time. We're not sure if this was a slow process or a longer process. We don't know whether perhaps the graves were tended and the mounds were um, maintained at all. 
because it's on gravels, uh, the gravel would have slipped over time, particularly if people walked on it. So to preserve the mounds, you would have to keep sort of mounding them up afresh. And perhaps this is what we're seeing here, this series of turf lines and gravels and more turf lines. It may also be that by putting turf in there, it also helps to sort of keep the mounds together so it didn't fall apart too much. Now, in trench three, we really struggle to see any evidence for a ditch. We're expecting to see around the, the, the burial mounds a ditch which they'd actually dug to dig out the gravel and to mound it up onto the top of the mound. But it looked more like they'd actually scraped the gravel. So rather than dig a ditch, which is quite hard in gravel because it keeps falling in, they've actually scraped the surrounding area up onto the mound. And we think that what they would have done would have they would have um, chosen the spot for the burial mounds, and they would have then um, buried the person in, in in into the gravel and then mounded up the gravels over the top. Um, it looks like there are probably two or three central burials which are larger and then a whole series of satellite burials running off them in different directions. So the larger barrows, which you can see if you visit the park in the centre, are probably the original barrows, and then they've actually then um, buried um, in lines away from those central burials. In Trench 4, we've got even more evidence for these turf lines, which hopefully you can see here. But also in the right-hand image, I, hopefully you can see it's a mu there's a much darker layer here, which is a much sort of darker dump of sort of darker gravels. Um, one thing we haven't identified with any of our work was any evidence for Saxon activity. We had no Saxon finds from any of our digging on the burial on the on the burial mounds. But I was looking through the finds again today as part of my work, and I'm wondering whether um, what we did find was a lot of Victorian material. And I'm wondering whether the Victorians came to the site and actually um, added new gravels to the top of the mounds, which over the, the 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 next century has then washed down off the edges of the mounds again, because the the sort of big dark layer you can see on the right hand image was full of um, glass, bottle glass, china, clay pipes, bits of brick, bits of roof tile, all of of Victorian date. So either they were having some really big parties up there and they were doing plate smashing and bottle smashing, or perhaps um, more prosaically. Um, these mounds had been sort of um, improved, perhaps during the Victorian period, perhaps even by the Admiralty making good the damage they did to the other mounds. Um, on the left image, hopefully you can see that there's a, a, a grey area in the bottom there, which I think is actually the core of the mounds. So it could be that these mounds started out much smaller and then over time were added to and, and made larger through the addition of extra gravels and turfs. So we are still missing the Saxons. The only Saxon evidence we have is from um, Douglas's illustrations, but we do have um, some, uh, some, uh, a small amount of worked flint here. So these are struck pieces of flint, which are prehistoric in date. And so it would appear that there is some prehistoric element to the site. Also, when work was taking place there in the, 18, in the 1800s, um, there's a reference to stone implements being found. So it could be that at the centre of this um, site, there was uh, perhaps a Bronze Age burial mound and the Saxons have then come to the site, referenced the original prehistoric mound and added their mounds around it, perhaps in, the, in, in doing so flattening the, the prehistoric mound. So it may be that the origin of this site is prehistoric, but all of the standing um, uh, burial mounds as we see them today are Saxon. The other interesting thing is that um, the line of the Roman road would pass this site if it does come through the park as we think. So perhaps the Roman road was lined up to a prehistoric burial mound and then our Saxon burial mounds are uh, actually then built alongside the course of this Roman road, although we can't see it on the ground today. And one last find we had, which was really nice, was this little pocket watch or fob watch, which dates to the early 20th century and was found actually pushed into the turf in one of the burial mounds with a couple of coins that dated to World War One. And so we are wondering whether perhaps this is some memorial uh, to a family member or friend who was perhaps lost in World War One and uh, somebody else came up to the burial mounds and deliberately pushed this fob watch into the top of the mound. It hadn't been dropped 
and buried it had actually been almost been pushed into the turf so it's a really sort of evocative little story which you don't quite understand but hopefully through um, sort of further work we'll learn a bit more about it um, and then very quickly this is how the site looks today um, we've We've uh, replaced the horrible tarmac with soils and it's now all grassed over and we'll be taking the fences down through the course of uh, 2023 and hopefully then the, the, the barrows will sit in their sort of original landscape more effectively um, and then uh, people will be able to enjoy them by treading lightly across them. We've also been doing some work on what's called the Park AI. So this is a, 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 a archaeological notification map, which uh, basically encourages um, the, the parks to let us know when any archaeological work is or any work is taking place in areas of high archaeological potential. So these are maps developed by AOC Archaeology and Historic England. And in these red areas, if any work red areas, if any work is taking place, we, we want to sort of make sure that, that that's being watched as part of the sort of the work within the Royal Parts Network. And this has already paid dividends because in the area to the east here, near what is the Roman temple site, we watched a series of tree pits being dug and we found part of a Roman roof. And uh, now this is a this is a, a museum example, but we found elements of a Roman tegula, which are these large flat tiles. And these are about at least 100 meters away from our Roman temple site. So the image on the right is our Roman temple. Um, there's nothing to see above ground now, but we know that work through the late 19th and 20th centuries identified at least two phases of a Roman temple building in the park, again, quite close to our Roman road. So we want to return perhaps to the area where the tree pits were dug to try and identify more evidence for Roman activity through the course of the rest of the project. We've also done some work on the parterre banks, which are the banks which were designed by uh, Le Nurture for Charles II um, to enclose the Queen's field. And where we dug test pits, we've identified evidence for both pipe smoking, um, coins being dropped, and uh, jacks or five stones, which are these counters you can see in my, my sort of grubby hand here. So we know that people have been coming into the park for a long time, sitting, smoking, gambling, uh, dropping coins, taking in the views, and then moving on and wherever we do work in the park particularly where there are good views like on one tree hill we know to expect to find evidence for people having been there in the past and stopping to have a smoke or to have a gamble or just to take in the views now very quickly because i'm conscious of time um the, the sort of second project the big community project we ran in uh, in the summer of 2022 was at the magnetic observatory site uh, so this was a uh, a uh, adjunct to the main observatory which existed in the park between the 1890s and 1950s it started life as a magnetic observatory so to take accurate readings of magnetic north and then when um, there was too much interference from um, uh, the electrification of the area and um, metal work etc etc in the park that was taken away in the 1920s and in the 1930s a observatory building, a new telescope site was built on the same um, like on the same area. So this is um, just north of the bandstand for those of you that know Greenwich Park and just uh, east of uh, Queen Elizabeth Oak. So this site is part of the Royal Observatory. It started life as a magnetic observatory. And then when that was pulled down in the 1920s, a series of telescope buildings were built, including a transit circle telescope, which allows you to sort of track the movement of stars across the night sky, as I understand it. Um, this is an image on the right on the left here from the 1950s showing the site just before it was pulled down. And when we were working at the park, um, quite a few people who remember being remember the park as children were not aware that this was here because it was surrounded by this high fence and a hedge. But you can also you can see hopefully the YAP telescope here, which is this new telescope building, the transit circle telescope and another pavilion building here. So you, uh, the, the photos on the right show the magnetic pavilion, which looks like a sort of tea hut, but because it had to be magnetically neutral, all of the nails in it are made of copper. There are no iron nails in it at all. So it's made of copper nails, uh, wood and lead sheeting. And then bottom right, you've got the YAP telescope, um, the observatory approached by a philanthropist called William Johnston Yap, who offered to buy them a telescope 
but they had nowhere to put it. So then he agreed to build them a telescope building in the park for the new telescope. And that lasted on site from the 1930s to the 1950s when it was moved to Hurst Monsoon in Sussex. And the dome, the telescopic dome, was then actually moved to South Africa. So I think this is still standing in South Africa. And at some point I need to track down some photographs of it. So elements of the building have been recycled over time. And if you want to learn more about this amazing site, do go to the Royal Observatory Greenwich.org website, which is Graham Dolan's, um, who is a the honorary curator of the Royal Observatory and has written extensively about all of this site and its importance. So we undertook some geophysics here on the left. So this is probing the ground for changes in the um, uh, resi earth, the, the electrical resistance in the ground. And we dug a few test bits to see what we could expect to find. Now, the geophysics was very confusing. Uh, and the reason for that, as it turned out, was that the whole site had been very comprehensively, de um, comprehensively demolished. But you can see here on the geophysics, it's very hard to make out any of the buildings comparing it to the map on the right um, on the on this on this geophysics plan at all and that's because of the level of demolition that had taken place so this is a, an aerial photograph from last summer and you can see the remains of the magnetic pavilion and the remains of the yap telescope um, being excavated and then photographed by our aerial friends at university of greenwich so by a quirk of fate, the magnetic pavilion, which was the first building on the site, survives the best uh, because after it was pulled down in the 1930s, there was a large sort of bush or shrub over the top of it, which protected it when the rest of the site was demolished in the 1950s. So uh, over a third of the building survives and you can see the concrete plinth here. Um, you can also hopefully see these are Royal Dalton drains, so no expense was spared on the drains. Um, and if you look on our blog on the um, Royal Parks website, you can actually see a 3D model of this site created by uh, volunteer Pete Barry, who's done a whole series of 3D models of our dig here and on the Barrow site as well. This is just another lovely illustration of the magnetic pavilion. It would have made a really brilliant tea hut if it was still standing today. You can imagine queuing for tea and sandwiches in this building. But unfortunately, it was pulled down in the 1930s. And this is the YAP telescope. This is a section through the YAP telescope. Um, we were hoping that we'd get the below ground remains surviving to be able to survey them in. But as it turned out, the whole site had been comprehensively demolished right to the base of the foundations. Even these huge concrete blocks, which had been designed to hold the telescope up, independent of the building to uh, to stop vibrations affecting the telescope uh, measurements. Even these blocks have been completely ripped out to the base of the foundations. So the only bits of surviving of the building were those buried sort of almost a meet, uh, almost half a meter below the ground. And in this aerial photo, um, another one from Pete, you can hopefully see what had survived, which were all the services. So although they'd ripped the building apart, they'd left all the drains in, all the electricity supplies, um, the loo drains, the the um, the grey water drains, and just one small part of the concrete floor. So of the the whole floor of the building, they'd left one small part of the floor. Everything else had been upturned um, and, and 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 pulled aside. So we had one small element of the floor surviving. One element of which was very interesting about these buildings were that all of the electricity cables, particularly the early supplies for the buildings, were encased in these um, stoneware conduits. And we think this is partly because rats elsewhere on the site had been chewing through the telegraph cables in the ground. And so when the Royal Observatory came to build these buildings, they decided to encase them in these conduits or pipes in bitumen or rubber as well to prevent the rats getting in and chewing the cables. And just lastly, hopefully it's a bit pale this image, but this basically shows our survey um, of the buildings as they survive overlaid on a plan of the site. And you can see the magnetic pavilion in the center here and then our work on the YAP telescope, which basically excavated half of the site. So there's half of the YAP telescope still there to be looked at by future generations. 
most importantly, the, the most important thing about the dig we did last summer was uh, the involvement of local schools and uh, local families and, and community and the local community. Um, so over the course of a week, we had nine school classes come along to the dig, um, which was a quite intense experience, but really good fun. Uh, I think we had almost uh, 240 school children take part over the week. Um, so they all got a chance to dig. They all got a chance to wash finds and identify the finds they were looking at. And we worked with our partners, the Field Studies Council, who helped us to deliver these school activities. And the boys here, bottom right, they're just digging out a, a bit of the concrete foundation, which they then try to sell to me uh, at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, the bottom left, you can hopefully see some of the family groups involved. We also work with our young archaeology club, local young archaeology clubs. Um, so they were able to take part. Um, and it was a really great experience. Our September project, um, so last September, was looking at the conduits in the park. So these are the water receivers in the park, um, which helped channel water down towards uh, the old Royal Naval College and the Tudor Palace before that. And we know there were a series of water conduits near the old keeper's cottage, which was where the uh, park was managed originally. Um, between the 1600s and the 1800s uh, before all of the park buildings were moved to the edges of the park. So originally the park was administered from the centre of the park and then in the middle of the 19th century these buildings were all pulled down and it was moved to the edges. But we were lucky enough to identify the remains of one of the uh, um, at least three of these conduit buildings and we think on the left here that we have an illustration of one of these buildings as well. So they're quite nice little um, brick built houses, brick and stone uh, sitting in the landscape. Uh, some of them are probably several hundred years old when they were knocked down in the late um, 1800s. So by the 20th century, all of the conduits had been had disappeared apart from one tree hill and the standard conduit down near St Mary's Gate. At the moment, we're working on in the wilderness, which is the area where the deer park is, and we're looking for a uh, looking for evidence of a rifle range, um, which we know we think dates from the middle of the 20th century. And hopefully, in this image here, you can see evidence of the rifle range here. It's this little line here. So this was a 2-2 uh, rifle range. Um, we know it's still here in the 1960s because we can see it on various OS maps. Um, it's also now going to uh, although there's nothing showing above ground, it's the site of our new learning centre. So we're trying to learn as much about what's left of the rifle range before the new learning centre is built on top of it. And you can see here, this is the map for the 1960s on the left, and then on the right is the sort of the new learning centre, which is going to basically um, be sat on top of the rifle range. So we're just trying to learn as much as we can about the foundations of the building before we uh, build this learning centre on top of it. And then finally, uh, because I'm aware of the time, um, in 2023, so this uh, this May, we're going to be doing a dig on the Barrage Balloon Base, which is um, uh, just below One Tree Hill. Uh, this is a World War II uh, Army base um, where they, they actually, um, I think it's Army, could be Air Force. Um, they had a Barrage Balloon tethered to this site, which was then um, um, obviously flying over Greenwich Park to discourage bombers from coming in low over Greenwich Park aiming for the docks. So we it looks like from this aerial photo from 19 the 1940s, there was um, at least one barrage balloon tether and a whole series of support buildings and what could be an air raid shelter. So during May and June this year, we're going to be investigating this site, working with local groups, local schools, and hopefully some students from uh, University College London to understand this site uh, further um, as part of uh, the next element of Greenwich Park Revealed. And in the middle of the image, hopefully you can see um, the Magnetic Observatory still standing during World War II. So I will stop there, a whistle stop tour through um, the archaeology that we've been looking at at Greenwich Park. I'll just finish with this image. This is an image from 1680, so just after the Grand Ascent and the Parterre Banks had been um, landscaped um, during the reign of Charles II. You can see the Queen's House here. And then on the right of the image, you can just make out what's left of the old Tudor Palace. So this is a, a fantastic image. It shows the, the end of the Tudor Palace, the Naval College and Queen's House in there. Uh, you've got the Parterre Banks. And then on the left hand side, you've got at the top there, the newly built observatory, the Royal Observatory. And in the background, 
you've actually got, if you can zoom in, you'll find this image online in the National Maritime Museum collection. You can actually see the smouldering remains of um, London town after the Great Fire and the various spindles here are what's left of the various churches. So it's a really, really great image to look at in detail. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening uh, and I'm very happy to take questions. Well, thank you so much, Andrea. It's um, really fascinating. There's so much there that you've covered, isn't there? Just an incredible amount to carry on exploring in the next um, next few years. And um, we yes. do have questions. We've got um, several that were submitted in advance um, and uh, several on the chat as well. Um, some of them you've uh, covered on your talk, so I'll skip over those. I've, I've kind okay. of ordered them to put to you. I do what I know we're sort of basically out of time, but I'm hoping you can stay on a bit longer. And, I'm um, very happy to run over yes. slightly. Brilliant. Sorry, thank I you. carried on talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've grouped them slightly sort of to start with following on from the bits you've been the, the things you've been talking about and then it sort of moves on to some other more uh, more general stuff so firstly yeah. um, is the Duke Humphrey that you mentioned the same one as the library in Oxford yes it is yes it's the same Humphrey Duke of Gloucester yes um, it is the same person there we go um, <laughs> that's a quick one <laughs> um, when people used to dig the barrows did they do so simply for research purposes or were some of them hoping to financially benefit from the fines that's a very good question so antiquarian so Douglas was an antiquarian basically at that point a lot of it was about collecting so you wanted to collect some great examples of different objects and then you might trade them for objects that other collectors had. So you weren't necessarily um, uh, selling them for money, but you were trading them for uh, collections of other objects that other people held. So I'm not I don't think that Douglas sold any of the items from the, the barrows. It's more likely they were traded and that's what happened to a lot of them. OK. Um, thank you for that. Um, the uh, next question is about the um, the staircase feature, um, which you, you yes. touched on briefly. Um, the, the, this person was just asking for a bit of an update on um, on what's happening with the res restoration of that. Yes. Yeah, so the plan is we're going to try and actually restore a series of the steps, uh, the the original Grand Ascent steps. So these are these steps that basically uh, run from the Queensfield up to the Wolf Statue. Originally, I think there were around twelve. We're going to um, put in, I think, six or seven steps. Um, we're not going to dig them into the hillside. We're actually going to build them out. So they'll be sitting over the original steps, but they're actually will recreate the, the 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 what you would have seen if you were during the Charles II period looking up from the Queen's House towards the observatory. You'd have seen this amazing stepped um, ascent up to the top. That's going to look spectacular, isn't it? Yes. Really yes. Looking forward to that. <laughs> um, do you feel that the Roman temple in Greenwich Park has been adequately excavated? Uh, could, more, could more be made of the site? I suspect <laughs> the question that has an opinion there. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the trouble with that site is it's been dug by uh, a number of people a number of times. So Time Team had a go at it. Um, it was looked at in the 1970s. It was looked at uh, in the 1890s. Um, and all of that work uh, a lot of it's been brought together by Becky Wallower in London Archaeologist, um, but it would be a very difficult site to go back to now and make more sense of it because it's been looked at piecemeal. Um, it would probably make more sense to look at the areas around the temple to actually date the site better than trying to re-excavate the temple again. Thanks. Um, a question about the underground spaces in the park. So where do the underground spaces in the park connect to? Um, and is, is the underground, sort of the, the full extent of the underground spaces, are, are they fully mapped? They are not fully mapped. We have various uh, images which suggest where they are, but what we're hoping to do in the next half of the project is actually scan them and create an underground model. Uh, I don't know if any of you watched Digging for Britain the other week, but they did this with one of the um, the I think it was a it was a cobalt mine in Cheshire. They created this 3D model which you can spin and actually work out where all of the um, tunnels are going uh, and the underground conduits leading down to the palace. So that's what we'd like to do. Exciting. Um, and uh, originally did the park boundary reach as far as the Thames Riverbank? That's a really great question. We know roughly the area that is enclosed now is the area that Duke Humphrey enclosed. We also know that James I got in trouble for, for snatching other bits of land around the park. So I think originally you had the, the, the deer park behind the palace. So the palace went down to the river and then the, from the Queen's House uh, south was the deer park. But it has been bits have been snaffled and also more recently bits have been snaffled off the park for buildings around the park. So it has sort of changed over time, but it's roughly the shape it was. 
Perfect. Okay. Um, there's a question that's just gone into the chat here. There's some damage to the General Wolf statue at the viewing point next to the observatory. Any insight on what what that uh, what happened there? That is uh, due to a World War Two air raid. Uh, the observatory was bombed a number of times, and we actually have a bomb map which was maintained by uh, a military officer in the Greenwich area, and it shows a string of bombs going across the observatory site. It looks deliberate. And rather than just an occasional bomb which might have been dropped on the way back or from the docks, this was actually a whole line of bombs um, which actually damaged part of the observatory and presumably then caused shrapnel damage to the wolf statue. So when we do our work on the, work on the wolf statue, that will be an element we want to obviously dig into further and, and research. OK, um, and then on to some sort of slightly more general ones. So who owns the land of the royal parks? Is it the state or the royal family? That it's it we, we manage it as a charity, don't we, Richard? I think that's yeah. the best answer. For that yeah. One. So the yeah the, the the royal um well the king now um owns the land, I believe, and and the government has the responsibility to look after it, and they contract that out to the charity to the royal parks um charity. Um. So yes, it is owned by the by the king. Um. How he did do archaeology oh, at university, didn't he? So did he? I didn't know that. He did. He did a he did a joint honours degree, and a part of it was archaeology. So we'll have to get have to get oh, King Charles along to have a look. Absolutely, <laughs> watch this space. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll have to get him in. Um, how can someone become a community archaeologist? That's a really great question. Um, I think uh, get, getting a range of experience, actually going, you know, getting a range of experience with public archaeology as well. Uh, community archaeology jobs do actually come up. A lot of these larger lottery projects, like the one I'm working on, often have a heritage element, which they actually then require a sort of community archaeology role. So if you like working with the public and you like working with volunteers and schools, then community archaeology is definitely something to consider. Um, and if you want to gain some voluntary experience, you can always talk to me <laughs> directly. Yes, we had several qu uh, questions actually, because uh, you'd be careful what you wish for there. You might okay. get inundated because <laughs> um, we had several questions uh, posted about how to volunteer. I assume people mean um, uh, volunteer on the archaeology side of things. I, I'll do a quick plug that there are lots of volunteering opportunities through the Royal Parks and you can go onto the um, Royal Parks webpage uh, to the volunteering tab and see all the range of opportunities there. But is there a particular way that you can get involved in the archaeology side of things? Well, again, if you look at the Royal Parks website, you, there's a whole range of blogs on there about the work we're doing and there should be contact details on there. Um, otherwise, I don't know. Can we can we send out contact details to, to people who've signed up? Is that possible? Richard, yeah, we or? can. Your, your contact details. Yeah. Yep, of course. Yeah, yeah we can do that. Um, and uh, M on the chat here has asked about um, volunteering or getting involved in the digital digitization catalog a catalogation of find is that a word I didn't know that of um, of findings so on that side of things is uh, well, are you, are volunteers yeah, involved in that I would love to get more people involved in the cataloging and digitization of our finds because we have a massive finds both in the projects we're doing now and uh, Graham Keevil, or I should have mentioned, I very badly didn't mention him. Graham Keevil did a lot of community archaeology work in the park before me and we have all of his finds as well. So it would be a really great opportunity to work with people who are interested in finds and would like to get more handling of finds to actually be part of that project. Brilliant. Well, that's yeah, very exciting opportunity. Um, and I think I've got one more question for you, um, which is, a, I think, a good one to end on. What is the best find you have ever made? <laughs> uh well um i i there is a there's one i i am i will be able to talk about perhaps a, a future talk which i can't talk about yet a, a top secret one um, so we'll have to have another winter warmer <laughs> next year um but the one i can talk about is um, when i was working at heathrow um ahead of terminal five being built we were digging a water hole which was sort of dug in prehistory um as wells in the landscape and at the bottom of it i found parts of a prehistoric um uh, wooden um, container so this would have been dropped in the bottom of the water hole and had been preserved in the bottom of the water hole for thousands of years because it had stayed wet and so that was pretty cool to actually find part of a prehistoric wooden water container it was pretty amazing wow fantastic and yeah we'll look forward to uh 
to the the news of whatever the other one is that you're, <laughs> you're talking about as well. <laughs> um, I think um, we probably have to wrap up there, but thank you, Andrew, so much for a, um, a fantastic presentation and for taking the questions as well. And thank you to everybody who's joined us tonight. Um, if you have enjoyed it and you'd like to make a donation to support our work, then uh, the link uh, is in the chat. I'll pop it in again at the bottom uh, so you can find it easily. Um, and I'll also put a link to our future online talks uh, and our walking tours in the parks and other events as well. I must give a special mention for the next uh, in our winter warmer series, which is going to be a bit different. So on the 9th of February, we're going to be celebrating the 150th anniversary of Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park um, with a special theatrical online talk, which will enable all of us to meet the suffragette icon Christabel Pankhurst. Um, so it's going to be a unique evening. Uh, with a professional theatre company uh, and again it's available to you online and for free so don't miss it you can sign up through the link that I'm going to put in the chat now and I do hope to, uh, to see you there and um, thank you everybody again for joining tonight and to Andrew do enjoy the rest of your evening and we'll see you very soon bye-bye <laughs>